Hello, and welcome to Trailblazers. My name is Nick Braganza. Joining me today is an exceptional individual. Nadia Vergi is the Chief of Staff to the Director General of Expo 2020 Dubai and UAE Minister of State for International Cooperation in the UAE Foreign Ministry. With 13 years in the UAE government, Nadia has served in the Prime Minister's International Affairs Office and the Foreign Ministry. In her current role for Expo 2020 Dubai, she brings her experience across policy, campaigns, strategy, thought leadership, and storytelling to build compelling physical and digital experiences for a wide audience. A graduate of University College London and the London School of Economics, Nadia has over 20 years of experience in the field of policymaking, government affairs, and international relations, spanning the globe from Washington DC to Brussels, London, and Dubai. One of her prof many professional accomplishments includes securing one of the first historical political agreements between the European Commission and the Aga Khan Development Network. As part of her role at Expo 2020, Nadia oversees People and Planet, a program designed to inspire meaningful action for addressing the world's most critical challenges. Nadia, welcome to Trailblazers. Uh, join us today in the shadow of the Al Wasl Dome. What an honor to be here at Expo 2020 Dubai. Thank you so much for joining us today for this interview. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Nadia, you were born in London. Uh, your parents were born in, well, well, are from Kenya. How has your upbringing influenced your life and your career trajectory? So I think um, service has always been sort of a golden thread of mm. everything that my parents have, have raised me in, a practice of, of service, of, already, of always contributing to your community, of things that you're, that you're doing being very impactful. So I think everything that I've ever done has really stemmed from, uh, from a life of service and a life of duty um, that my parents sort of raised us in. Um, but also, I, I really did benefit from the fact that I come from a very open-minded family. So while my brother and my father were lawyers, um, I sort of had that, that sort of uh, space open to explore and study comparative literature and do international relations and things that at the time weren't so familiar to my parents mm -hmm. or perhaps the generation that I was growing up in. Um, and so, you know, that sort of led me to live in different places um, and explore different sort of facets of who I am. And that sort of, I guess, helped develop my interdisciplinary mindset. And that really has um, shaped uh, the decisions that I've made and the journey that I've taken and where I am today. I guess I can also describe myself as a global citizen. Mm. And I'm married to a Lebanese Brazilian. There are lots of different languages around the table at home. And um, it's sort of no... Uh, no sort of, uh, it's not out, out of the ordinary that I'm working for a Minister of International Corporation and, you know, we're here at a World Expo. I have ended up doing the complete opposite of what I started out to do. So when I started out, I studied comparative literature as my undergraduate degree. Okay. So French and Spanish, comparative literature, I spent time in living in France, I lived, spent time living in Spain. That wasn't really a vocational degree. People would say, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I would say, I'm not sure. But I always did what I enjoyed and I always did what I was good at. So I'd found kind of a, an area that I really thrived in and that was always something that, that drove me. I think beginning to understand how to speak to people in their own language and beginning to understand how to read people and their history is, a, is fundamental. Otherwise, how can you begin to work in a, in a global context like you work in? So of course, that was a, a fundamental building block. Um, but then I've always had an interest in international relations and politics and didn't really know where that would land. But then I did a master's in international relations um, and I focused in on European policy and European politics. So that was my sort of my landing page. Um, that took me then to the US where I worked um, for a year in Washington DC for the European Union um, as an intern and then went back to Brussels, which is where every aspiring European you know, politico wants to be and I was there for a very long time. When I came here um, as the, uh, the Europe desk officer in the International Affairs Office of the Prime Minister, which is where I met Her Excellency, she's been my boss for 13 years, um, but my, 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 all, everything that I put in place before really led me to that point where I could combine the European politics with the languages, with really sort of understanding how to navigate complex pop political complexities. Um, and then she made me head of strategy for the Expo bid. And so the sort of the trajectory wasn't really 
a clear one. It wasn't really a, um, a linear one. There were just lots of very different building blocks that I put in place and I took advantage of every opportunity I had, was very open about every single experience that was, that was offered to me and it was hard work, hard work, hard work uh, with a little bit of creativity and, um, and just having a mentor like Her Excellency to be able to chaperone me on the journey with her. And that's been, I mean, it's been astonishing in every way. And at Expo, your journey started 10 years ago when you led the bid for the, uh, the Expos uh, in Dubai. Fast forward to today, you are the Chief of Staff to the Director General. I mean, how did you get here? What does it mean to you? And uh, how do the values of Expo resonate with your own values? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So I think, um, you know, it, purpose has always been at the very heart of everything that we have done. And so we're not, I'm not, didn't decide to and wasn't really interested in just working for a World Expo for the mm. sake of it. It was all about taking the platform and the incredible opportunity that we had been given and to do something significant with it, do something more with it, do something incredibly impactful with it. And so sort of I think that sort of, you know, breadth of, um, of learning that I've had in those last 10 years of working on very different elements of the bid have enabled us to really weave in at the heart of all of this real impact. And, and that's, you know, that's really what has driven uh, where we are and what we've mm. been able to achieve. Mm. Amazing, amazing. The overarching theme of Expo 2020 is connecting minds, creating the future, the sub themes of sustainability, opportunity, mobility. His Highness the Aga Khan speaks of sharing knowledge and best practices uh, and building for the future. How does Expo 2020 promote those same values? Yeah. I've always been really struck by how similar the ethics and values and principles of our community are with those of the leadership of the UAE and really what we've ma what we've manifested in this site. Um, an expo, the World Expo, in, at any moment in time, in its moment in time, is about human progress. It's about human development. It's about human dignity. And at the very heart of this expo, is the principle and the foundation of human dignity, leveling the playing field for everybody, giving an equitable voice to every single nation, every person that walks through the doors. And that is also the founding premise of the Aga Khan Development Network and the work that it does. And so the alignment is, is really quite fundamental. A passion for justice, the quest for equality, a respect for tolerance, a dedication to human dignity, these are universal human values, which are broadly shared across divisions of class, race, language, faith, and geography. They constitute what classical philosophers in the East and West alike have described as human virtue, not merely the absence of negative restraints on individual freedom, but also a set of positive responsibilities, moral disciplines, which prevent liberty from turning into license. The Aga Khan Development Network has partnered with some of the Expo project. Is that right? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, we've worked very closely with the AKDN in various components of, of, mm. the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Expo. I know they were instrumental in uh, the design and the content of the Pakistan Pavilion. Um, they were instrumental in our urban and rural development week that we hosted, really focusing on uh, reaching the last mile, on ensuring um, you know the voices of the rural um, uh, community are heard, and that there is sort of sort of uh, a real focus on um, on um, on rural development um, as a feature at Expo as part of sort of that trajectory of, of human development and, and and social development. Voluntary service has been an important part of your life, as you say. Um, and the Aga Khan Development Network and its principles in respect of human dignity and relief uh, are examples of sustainable development. The AKDN uh, ethical framework reads, care of the environment is a duty of trusteeship which humankind owes over creation. Uh, each generation is thus 
ethic bound to leave behind a wholesome, sustainable social and physical environment. How has the work of the Imamat uh, inspired your journey? Yeah, so again, it's really about human dignity yeah. and it's about impact. Yeah. And I think through that experience and through any other experience that, that I've had, mm. it's always been driven by making sure that we leave a purposeful impact, that you're doing whatever you're doing in, your, in, your, in, your, in, in, in the setting that you're in, um, that you're able to, uh, to behave, that you'll be that you're able to think and that you're able to create in a way that's impactful and that really does stem from everything that we have been born and raised in mm-hmm. and the ethics of the of the of the of the community but also the practice and the work of the AKDM for our faith constantly reminds us to observe and be thankful for the beauty of the world and the universe around us and our responsibility and obligation as good stewards of God's creation to leave the world in a better condition than we found it. And sustainable development goals are are key here. My favorite question. In Dubai Dubai Expo. Um, And they include ending extreme poverty, fighting inequality, protecting the planet. Uh, How is Expo bringing awareness of these SDGs? The... um, uh, the, the the World Expo really is about uh, bringing to life uh, the moment it, a moment in time and really recognizing where humanity is in its progress. And so we, as an international community, have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a global framework to uh, to uh, commit to leaving no one behind by 2030. Yeah. So if we're going to host a World Expo in a pandemic, I and mean, we are still in a pandemic we have to recognize that that has set us back significantly from achieving those SDGs. And so as we built this site, the site took us five years to build, um, we almost look at a cross section of the expo. Uh, There were sort of at peak 55,000 workers working on site at any one moment. The way that we worked with them was really ensuring their wellness, their health, their human dignity uh, through a whole range of activities and engagement, really making them feel like a part of our tribe. The way that we uh, physically built the site, it is a sustainable city. Mm. Um, You know, uh, there are more than 200 lead buildings in this site that is twice the size of Monaco. It's four and a half uh, square kilometers. It's a huge, huge site. So making it green, you know, 30% of our roads um, are made of recycled tires. Um, Our buildings are 30% more efficient. Um, We have uh, we have um, carbon neutral buildings, so we actually generate energy. I mean, the 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 level of attention to detail in the physical build is is also I mean, it's an it's an incredible story to tell about how you can build green, how you can build sustainably. And since the majority of people are going to be living in cities, this is a really good example of of the kinds of initiatives and steps you can take to to build sustainably. Um, the way that we operate the site. We have achieved a 90% um, waste away from landfill target. So these sorts of sort of circular economy operational uh, recycling programs or the uh, the efforts that we're taking to manage food waste with all the countries all sort of begin to be a demonstration of how you can operate a space like this in a sustainable way. And then of course, you've been here at least 10 times, you know all the exhibitions yeah. that are dedicated to the themes of sustainability, mobility, and opportunity, which really wrap around the sustainable development goals. Um, They're interactive experiences where you can really begin to understand what sustainability means, what your role is in it, and the sorts of actions that you can take into your everyday life. And then um, we have the program for people and planet, which engages policymakers, the business community, individuals who want to, and are more conscious of, uh, the environment that they live in, but want to be more involved and understand the role that they can play. Um, we've had over 10,000 thought leaders come through the expo in the last six months, um, really beginning to push the needle and create new forms of partnerships that are really required to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Um, but then, of course, we hosted the Global Goals Week at Expo, which is the sort of the flagship event that takes place on the margins of the UN. It's the first time that they left the UN corridors and came to uh, another country. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. and mm. so it was phenomenal. We had the, the the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations here, Amina Mohammed, opened the the Global Goals Week. 
Um, and you know, we've had more than two million people, which is enormous, watch our content online and in a really sort of long. Our marketing team tells us that yeah. sort of ten minute viewing times are, is is really very. It's 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 a success. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the idea is that people are beginning to be galvanized around and understand better what the SDGs are. It doesn't really matter if you know what the acronym stands for, but you really are sort of more conscious about the environment, the world you live in, and the role that you can play. Um, what's really been very interesting is that now I've been sort of increasingly connected with and in touch with other cities around the world who are beginning to look at Expo as wow. an example of how you can build, how you can galvanize your community around understanding um, how to how to build sustainably and live a sustainable life, um, and that really is, I think, as as is sort of you know all we could have really yeah. wished for. So in every single facet of this site, it it really in every sort of you know um, every message that we could possibly communicate is around the sustainable development goals. With the global goals woven into the fabric of Expo 2020, I cannot think of a more appropriate place for us to renew our shared commitment to keep the promises that we made in 2015. So let us join hands together and end poverty, reduce inequality and protect our planet. Let us deliver the SDGs, our global goals for humanity now. Have you been to the Opportunity Pavilion? I haven't, no, I haven't yet. So that's your next step, yes. because the Opportunity Pavilion is the Sustainable Development Goals Pavilion. Okay. And it's sort of broken down into these really three easy steps for if people don't really understand the significance of the SDGs, which are very heavy, yeah. it basically says, you know, provide access to basic needs for everybody on this planet. Only then can you really start talking about an enabling environment. So quality access to healthcare, quality access to education, once sort of food, water, energy are in place, then you can sort of layer in uh, good governance, all of these other sort of elements that make a sustainable society. And that's your road to opportunity. Yeah. So take the kids, I take do. the kids there. How can we as individuals and as the Jamaat, you know, contribute more to the sustainability movement in yeah. your view? Yeah. Um, the way that we framed this um, was around really understanding uh, that there is so much information out there to the point that there is a lot of misinformation. But it's our responsibility, sort of as members of the community, but as leaders in our own field and individuals in our own right, to take that information and to turn it into knowledge. So knowledge is the foundation upon which you can make conscious choices. I think AKDN and the community does this very well through its time and knowledge program, yes. through the efforts that it's already undertaken. You know, we are committed volunteers in our own right. And I think as a community, if we're able to really sort of transcend that information to knowledge to a high level of consciousness about the things that we can do in our everyday life, and then communicate that out in our own spaces, um, then I think that would be a tremendous first effort and a leadership effort mm. that we could play um, in, in our respective worlds that we live in. Businesses have a crucial role to play in solving some of the world's greatest social and environmental problems. It's said that profitability equals stewardship. The Senorina Hotels, a division of the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, is one example of doing well and doing good. How Can you explain the opportunity associated with stewardship? So I think um, here, what we're talking about is um, really thinking about um, the opportunity cost of not being good stewards. Yeah. Um, we are talking about sort of intergenerational transformative change. We need to leave behind for our future generations. And so we are then responsible and mandated to be dutiful about people and planet and the natural finite resources that we have. Um, so it's not just economic stewardship and economic profitability, um, but it's ensuring that we leave something behind for our future generations. And if all of us sort of bear that in mind as we go about our respective lives, um, remembering that there is a sort of generation that's going to inherit the decisions and the outcome of the decisions that we make, um, and we need to be focused on really transformative change. Expo um, offers a chance to heal and be heard in many parts of the world much of the progress made in gender equality has been rolled back. In the last year alone, more than uh, women have lost $800 billion in income. The Women's Pavilion at Expo 2020 um, works to highlight the progress of women. 
you're a mother of a beautiful girl, Analia. Uh, I'm also the father of a beautiful girl. Um, what are your hopes for the next generation of women? And how can we as a society contribute to the and build on the works of generations of women before us? Yeah, so, so our daughters go to the same school. They're the same age. Yes, they do. We have done um, as much, if not aspire to do more than what our parents did for us. Yeah. So, you know, what I hope for both of them and for all of their peers um, is that these questions are no longer asked, that there's no longer a question about the role of women, that women and that girls and women uh, like our two daughters are able to stand in their own right as their own as human beings, um, but not necessarily being associated with the types of question of, well, what do we need to do uh, to empower women? Um, that's my aspiration for them both. Um, one of the sort of the most remarkable and humbling uh, moments of this expo for me has been uh, being embraced by these uh, by these phenomenal women who um, who have embraced me uh, like the likes of Amina Muhammad, like the likes of Indra Nui, who's the former CEO of Pepsi, just because of the role that I have played in support of another woman who is my boss. And that really has brought home for me the fact that women actually do support each other. Mm. And that's going to be fundamental for us to, to progress as women, but also the men who support, who support us too. So I think it's just this crescendo and rallying support of the effort, which is going to be required. Um, but, but I hope that these questions uh, are no longer questions that we need to ask. What this pavilion is really geared around is to, is to shed light on that and to land at the very end on a recognition that if you truly do want to see prosperity, then an equitable, fully inclusive society has to come into play. You mentioned your boss, uh, Her Excellency Reem al uh, You have worked closely for many, many years. Can you tell us a bit about your relationship and why it works so well? Yeah, I think very simply, um, you know, a life of service, a life of duty, mm. of integrity, of excellence, um, of love, I think that really defines the journey that we've taken together. World Expo has a mission to inspire hope through this experience. What have you learned about yourself, your abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses? <laughs> um, driven by impact and really, like I said, you know, not wanting to do something because it's a job necessarily, but I've been privileged enough to be able to have the ability to contribute significantly and to create and to be part of really beginning to start a movement. Um, that has been, you know, just a, a, an incredible um, gift and opportunity that I've been given. Mm. What's been the biggest challenge of, of, of this job? Oh my God, all of it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we wake up, I mean, Her Excellency is a gladiator. We wake up every day with a different sort of challenge. Yeah. Uh, we have 192 nations. You've got heads of state, heads of government coming in every day. Uh, you're still operating in a COVID context. You have 300,000 300, people on site in any one given day. Um, you know, the opportunities are enormous. The challenges are enormous, um, but you just have to maintain flexibility. You have to be nimble, uh, make smart decisions quickly, uh, get good advice, um, and just be very resolute about what it is that you want and, and, and go and get it. And with that sort of gladiatorial attitude, uh, we've, been, we've been able to, to deliver. What is the legacy that Expo 2020 will leave for Dubai? It's, it's been really um, significant that this expo has been held for the first time in this part of the world, in the Middle East, South Asia and Africa region. Um, for the first time in, in expo history, every single nation has its own pavilion. You know, it really has been about the South. With economic centers of gravity shifting east, you know, it's really uh, it's a statement um, about, you know, whether the, 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 the future of the world is going to be. Um, and that's really important for this part of the world also because the Middle East and this, you know, this wider region is young and growing. Um, and it requires a sort of aspiration and inspiration like, like Expo. And we'll see another Expo come back to the Middle East, inshallah. And good luck to the team who's going to deliver it. <laughs> The legacy is where we began. The physical legacy, what this place will look like, and the reputational legacy, what will it leave behind? What will it mean? That's what drives us every day. And what does legacy mean to you, Nadia? Yeah, um, so I think for, for me, it's a very personal story. Sure. Um, my, my family, Suleiman Verji, left uh, India in the 1880s. 
um, you know, settled in Nairobi in Kenya, where my family is from, um, built the first uh, darkhana uh, at some point in the early 1900s. And so sort of the legacy um, of the work that, that began with him has continued on through generations. Um, and I had, you know, the, the, the most humbling moment when um, I had the opportunity to be introduced to Hazraman in, uh, in Brussels when we signed the, the declaration between AKDN and, um, and the EU. And when they said, uh, this is Nadia Virgi, he said, Virgi, you are the fourth generation of Virgis that I know. And that for me is legacy and responsibility right there. What's next for you? What, 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 what's your next uh, project, your next uh, um, ambition as we come to the close of Expo? A short holiday <laughs> and well deserved, hopefully sure. something equally transformative. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Nadia. It's been a pleasure. Um, and uh, we wish you the best for the, for the last few weeks of Expo. Uh, and for your future. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're standing at the heart of the Expo site, uh, which is about twice the size of Monaco. It's about four and a half square kilometers. And behind me is our iconic Al Wassel Dome, which is an immersive 360 degree uh, projection dome that has over 250 projectors that really brings to life an immersive experience by day and by night. Um, I think right now we have our Young Stars program on um, and we've just finished celebrating the National Day of Zimbabwe. And then in front of us over here is the UAE Pavilion, uh, which has been designed by uh, the Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava, um, and it's in the shape of a falcon, and it has uh, these uh, solar panels that open and, and close on a hydraulic system. Uh, these iconic structures will remain in legacy, so if you haven't had the chance to enjoy them over the last five months, uh, then please come to the expo once our doors close and you'll still get to experience that.